Howdy there once again, YouTube. In this video, I'm going to talk about some very interesting stuff, so stay put and just grab a cup of coffee or something, maybe a beer if it's late at night. Let's hope it's not in the morning. <laughs> My name is Ben Ferriolo, and I'm dedicated to the responsible and accurate seismic monitoring of volcanic and tectonic hazard areas. Now, first off, if you have not already, please bookmark my website. A link is provided under my email address in the description box below. It contains a great deal of information, including how to understand the many types of seismic plots and charts people use, how to find, access, and analyze seismic data. It also contains hundreds upon hundreds of seismic plots and images regarding a great many seismic events and swarms on many many different pages. Trust me, you'd be surprised as to what you find. So, today we're going to talk about a few things. I do have a few earthquakes to go over, and then at Yellowstone, there's been some weird things on Seismic Station YNM, which is the seismic station closest to Steamboat Geyser that detects the Steamboat eruptions, saw a very strange looking event. And usually, surface noise is not detected on YNM because it is inside the museum. The only thing that is detected on YNM are footsteps and steamboat geyser eruptions. It can't really detect anything else but footsteps and steamboat eruptions. So we'll take a look at that. Also, near Borehole 208, near the northern tip of Yellowstone Lake, there was a very minor swarm. Very tiny. We're going to take a look at that as well and a few other things. So let's get started. Here we are at the most recent blog post that I have uploaded to my Seismo blog on my website, monitorsize.weebly.com. The link is below in the description box. A magnitude 3.4 in Tennessee, a magnitude 4.1 in Poland, and steamboat geyser erupts again. The past week of seismicity in the USA and the world as well has sure kept many amateur and professional seismologists busy. A lot of different things have been occurring lately and many different swarms and larger than normal earthquakes have been striking some odd areas. In this post, I will deal with the most recent strong magnitude 3.4 that hit Tennessee, a strange but normal looking magnitude 4.1 that hit Poland and Europe, and Steamboat Geyser erupted for the 8th time of 2019, which is actually the 40th time since it reactivated in early 2018. As usual, please click the title of this post or read more to continue. Magnitude 4.1 in Poland. Right here you can see the location of the magnitude 4.1 that struck Poland in respect to the closest seismic station to detect this event. There it is in western Poland and in eastern Germany is that seismic station which I actually had a hard time finding but I was able to gather data from. Now here's the USGS event page. But this past week of seismicity has been odd, not just for the United States but also for the world. First off, if you haven't heard about the recent magnitude 3.3 and aftershocks that struck Yellowstone just within minutes of the large magnitude 4.5 in Colorado, then please click here to visit that video I made and click here if you haven't seen that video, but I bet you probably have. Again, seismicity has been getting strange. Although Poland does see earthquake activity from time to time, it doesn't happen often, so it is worth noting. At 1655 UTC on March 5th, 2019, a magnitude 4.1 earthquake struck western Poland. Apparently, nobody reported feeling it, even though this magnitude 4.1 struck around 5.0 kilometers in depth. Either it is true nobody felt it, or nobody in Poland even knows what USGS is. So it is po possible, excuse me, people near the epicenter did feel this earthquake, even if the did you feel it report is at zero. And here I will show the plots. Okay, this at least to me appears to be a normal tectonic magnitude 4.1 in Poland. However, do not hold me to that since I have no clue what fault this even struck on, or if Poland even has major faults. But if this is tectonic, then obviously they do have faults, but they've just never been mapped out, I guess. This is unfiltered. There's no filter. You can see the earthquake right here. Dominant mid-range frequencies, but again, this instrument does not detect the higher frequencies too well. It only goes to 10 hertz. That is not the setting that I set. It automatically set that for me. I tried to set it to 25 hertz. It wouldn't let me. The maximum frequency range for the spectrogram is 10 hertz. Very interesting. Now, this is the same event as shown above. However, there is a 0.6 hertz high pass filter added to mostly remove the background microseisms that broadband stations detect well. That's it right there. Again, dominant mid range frequencies. A little bit lower than what I would expect, but let's move on and go down to the magnitude 3.4 in Tennessee. Along with the magnitude 4.1 in Poland, the magnitude 3.4 struck Tennessee near Maynardville. If I said that correct, please let me know. It struck on March 5th, 2019 at 2056 UTC at 17.1 kilometers in depth, a little bit deeper than what we have been seeing lately for this area. 
Tennessee does see earthquake activity, but even more so lately. Remember, on December 12th, 2018, at 9.14 UTC, a magnitude 4.4 struck near Decatur, Tennessee. Please let me know if I said that right at 7.9 kilometers in depth. So why is there such an increase in activity lately? A 4.4, and then about three or four months later, there's a 3.4. That's very interesting. Now, the first image that you see here shows the location of the magnitude 3.4 at 17.1 kilometers in depth in relation to the closest seismic station. Now, this image right here is the USGS event page for this earthquake. Although this was a deeper magnitude 3.4, how in the Heck, was it felt so strong? 1,677 people reported feeling this to USGS. And this event page was saved uh, about 24 hours ago, so this number might even be higher by now. But they don't even have a focal mechanism solution yet, and they still do not have an explanation on there yet. Just the did you feel account, which was far too high for a 3.4. I mean, I don't think, I, that's pretty crazy. And again, that is only the people that decided to send a report to USGS. So it isn't that 1,677 people felt it. It's that 1,677 people sent a report to USGS saying they felt it. Wow. I believe that is the most people I've ever seen for any Did You Feel It report for a magnitude 3.5 or below. Below are the top magnitudes recorded by the seismic stations around the area. Notice there were some stations... However, they were not checked by seismologists. Notice the higher magnitudes. I touched uh, quick magnitudes so that the highest one would be at the top and the lowest one at bottom. The largest magnitude detected, and it's, mag it's duration magnitude, which is the strength and how long it lasted, was a magnitude 5.6. <laughs> magnitude 5.6 on this station. But I do not believe that is correct because all of these are automatic, not checked by seismologists. And yes, now it, the event did last very long on these stations. Remember, magnitude, uh, duration magnitude detects the duration of the strength, right? So the longer it is, somewhat the larger it's going to be, right? But I'm guessing it is around uh, probably a 4.0. I'm thinking it's definitely around a 4.0. I think 3.4 is definitely a little bit too small, guys. Especially at 17.1 kilometers in depth. And over 1,600 people reported feeling it. Yeah, that's... Definitely a lot more people. And here's the custom-made helicopter by myself of CPRT, which is the closest station to this event. Now, here's the helicopter. And I'm going to show three incremental three-pod images in just a second. But please remember to always read chart labels and any captures beneath any images. And there it is right there. Again, to me, that does not look like a 3.4. That definitely looks like a 4.0. Definitely. Beyond a shadow of a doubt, guys. That's what I truly believe. Now let's scroll down real quick. I have three incremental plots. Here's the first one. I wanted to capture the entire event. Notice 2056, 2057. So from here to here is one minute. Two, three, four, five, six. So from the beginning to the end lasted about six minutes. That's including the surface waves, guys. That is a long time for a 3.4, even at that depth. That's pretty crazy, guys. And again, we do see dominant lower frequencies. You notice that? We do have dominant lower frequencies below 10 hertz. But the thing is, is there are obviously strong frequencies going all the way. Look at the frequency on the spectrogram. Look at this. I had to set it to 50 hertz because of how high the frequencies went. Yeah. So it's definitely not a low frequency earthquake, guys. Very strong, very strong higher frequencies. But the strongest frequencies remain below 10 hertz. Very interesting. Here's the same event, but zoomed in just a little bit. Now, here's a really zoomed in look of this event, just to draw out some of the waveforms for you. Again, dominant frequencies below 10 hertz, but we can clearly see strong, strong frequencies going all the way up to what? Maybe 46 hertz or so. So, that was pretty crazy. That was the magnitude 3.4 in Tennessee. Now, let's move on. Steamboat Geyser erupts once again. This is Steamboat Geyser in the Norris Geyser Basin in the steam phase of eruption on March 16, 2018, just a day after the first water hydrothermal eruption of 2018. The infamous Steamboat Geyser, which resides in the Norris Geyser Basin at the Yellowstone Supervolcano, erupted for the 8th time of 2019, which is also the 40th time since it reactivated in early 2018. 
on March 5th, 2019. That is when it saw the eighth eruption of 2019. Actually, which would be just before midnight on March 4th, 2019, if you live in the mountain or Pacific time zones. First off, if you'd like to see the seismic plots and images to every single Steamboat Geyser eruption of 2018, then please click here. There's a button right there. And now if you'd like to see the seismic plots and images to every single Steamboat Geyser eruption that has occurred so far in 2019, then please click here. So this most recent eruption was the smallest Steamboat Geyser eruption ever recorded on Seismic Station YNM, which is the station closest to the Steamboat Geyser. Station YNM resides inside the Norris Museum and is basically only a few yards or so away from Steamboat Geyser. It's not that far. Maybe a little more than a few yards, but you know what I mean. Now, when the steamboat eruptions were far stronger in 2018, the surface vibrations of the eruptions would also show on Station YNR, which resides a few miles away from Steamboat. Since late 2018 to now, the steamboat eruptions are far too small to appear on Seismic Station YNR. Until today! Yeah. As you will see below, the 8th eruption of 2019 was the smallest ever recorded. However, it appeared on Seismic Station YNR. What? How the heck is that possible if the eruption was far too weak and all of the other previous weak eruptions never appeared whatsoever on YNR? I have no idea how this is possible, but let's check out the data, shall we? Remember to always read chart labels and any captions beneath any images. Let's show the two helicorders first in slideshow format. So look right here. I'm going to pause this real quick. Let's go back. YNMSHZ. This is uh, the webby quarters from isthisthingon.org, which is from the University of Utah. There's the Steamboat Geyser eruption right there. And the times are perfectly set on both the webby quarters. Now watch when I go forward. Keep your eye right there. Notice you will see, boom, looks like an there's an increase of energy right at the same amount of time. Ignore the spikes. I don't know what those are. They could be related to how it appeared on YNR, but I'm not looking at those spikes right now. That's for another research project later on. But, because actually, personally, I think this is some of the crust breaking open or something. Something allowed these vibrations to reach YNR. They usually don't. They usually don't, but the increase of energy you're about to see on the plots obviously shows that the steamboat eruption did appear on YNR, which previously has been impossible. But you can see it right there. Go back to YNM and YNR and YNM and YNR. Yep, very interesting. Although heli quarters found on my website are usually generated by me, these were generated by the University of Utah. Note on YNM, you can see the seismic trace of the steamboat eruption almost near the middle of the chart. It may be somewhat hard to see since it was quite weak. Now switch to YNR real fast. Boom. Notice the trace looks like it did appear on YNR at the same exact time as the trace on YNM. I didn't want to just go on that since it's pretty bad to only use helicorders and webicorders for research. So let's take a quick look at the plots. Note that this three plot image here is of the 8th steamboat eruption of 2019 as shown from station YNM. Please note the first burst in the eruption you can see on the seismogram and the spectrogram. Notice the first burst of the eruption around 638 UTC. The time mark is not shown, but you can see 638 UTC is where the first burst started, which 638 would pretty much be right about there. Now the main eruption burst started somewhere around 645 or so. Maybe about 644, but pretty sure it's 645. Please keep this pattern of the spectrogram, the colorful plot in the middle, in mind. So keep this pattern in mind as we look at the next plot. Whoa, that's pretty interesting. Holy crap! YNR really did capture the 8th steamboat eruption of 2019. Now how is that possible if the surface waves were far too weak? Regardless, you can clearly see the same exact pattern on YNR as you saw on YNM. Not only on the spectrogram can you see the pattern, but the seismogram plot as well. So, it did see the steamboat eruption. Let's scroll down just real quick. Now, here is a different three-plot image. Now, this three-plot image is filtered with a 12 hertz high-pass filter. This will show only the steamboat eruption. Well, except for the strange spikes at the beginning. We can confirm that YNR, which is southeast of Steamboat Geyser at Norris, did for sure detect the steamboat eruption on March 5th, 2019. Now, the amplitudes are extremely tiny, yes, but it detected it nonetheless. 
And why do you think this was possible? I have no idea. All of the other weaker eruptions of 2018, late 2018 and 2019, didn't even show on YNR at all. So why did this one? Below, I'm going to show the three-plot image along with the three-plot image from YNM. I'll put it in slideshow format so you could compare the two. There's YNM and there's YNR. YNM, YNR. Now, the times are not exact. You can see it's a little bit drawn back a little bit, but you can see the times match up for the start of the activity. However, on YNR, it did detect higher, much higher frequencies. Notice going up to about 45 hertz, starting around 15 hertz or so. You go back, these don't even go past really 25 hertz at all. So I don't know why YNR detected this steamboat eruption at a much higher frequency, but it still did detect it, which is very strange. Now let's move on to something else. Boy, we've had some earthquakes popping off lately. Guys, If uh, I ask you guys to pray for my uncle. He lives in the Philippines. He's a traveling minister. You know, he tries to teach people about Jesus Christ, you know, get people saved. Um, he's very old. He's got a heart monitor. And he lives in the Philippines near the Mayan volcano. The Mayan volcano, and he lives pretty close. Like, it's literally pretty much in his backyard. The Mayan volcano has been showing signs of increased activity. It's starting to steam almost constantly now. Activity is ramping up. I do believe a major eruption is approaching. And, you know, I told him, you might not want to be in the Philippines. And he said, you know, whenever the Lord wants to take him, the Lord's going to take him. And I said, you know, that's very true. So just keep him in your prayers, if you will. We do have some more earthquakes. Papua New Guinea. There was a 5.6 at 132.4 kilometers in depth. In Papua New Guinea, the uh, Manam volcano, I think it's called Manam volcano or something like that. That volcano erupted explosively the other day. Had a big ash plume and everything. And then we, in Japan, we had a 4.0 at 54.5 kilometers in depth. And then just recently in the past hour, there was a 4.9, almost 5.0. Then just to the southeast, we had a 5.0 near the volcano islands. Now, going over, over here, we did have a magnitude 6.4 in New Zealand, actually, which actually showed up quite well, the teleseism of it did, somewhat. And let's go to Hawaii, see what the past 24 hours of activity has been. Only seven earthquakes. Some deeper events have been transpiring lately. I don't know why it's been shifting from shallow activity to deep activity, too. And the activity is remaining south of the Kilauea caldera somewhat, Sometimes in a different location. There were some quakes up here near the northern tip of the big island not too long ago. But they are deepening. I do not know why there's a lot more earthquakes occurring at around 30 kilometers in depth to 50 kilometers in depth. There is even one reported the other day for 72 kilometers in depth. Which I believe is right beyond the boundary of an intermediate depth earthquake. So let's go to California real quick and let's zoom out. I don't want to look at California right this second. I want to look at the earthquake that just struck. Now, we already talked about this right here, the 3.4 in Tennessee. Just talked about that. But Ohio got hit by a 2.0. So I just walked away and just came back. And apparently, we have had three large earthquakes just in the past hour. And then one in Saudi Arabia. What? I mean, of course, I do get earthquakes here from time to time. But a 5.0 in Saudi Arabia... And then we have a 5.0 near the Volcano Islands, and then a 4.9. So guess what? 5.0, 5.0, 5.0. Three 5.0s in the same hour. That's very interesting. By the way, I just went outside. It's snowing here in Seattle. Well, I'm 20 miles northeast of Seattle, so we get a little bit colder temperatures. Sometimes Seattle is all rain, and we get all snow up here. Right now, it's snowing. We might get a good dusting to a good inch or two today. Probably south. Even in Tacoma, they're expecting snow. Seattle's supposed to be just rain right now, but I am surprised they predicted some snow for tomorrow, too. Not a crazy amount like we had recently. like Not like the two feet of snow that we got within a week that never melted. Finally, it's starting to melt. You know, we don't have any more outside except for these big, huge, massive piles of ice everywhere. So again, there was a 2.0 in Cleveland, Ohio. Let's check out the event page for this event real quick. Now, this magnitude 2.0 struck at 5.0 kilometers in depth, supposedly, if the depth is correct. This occurred at 4.15 UTC, March 6th, 2019.
which would have been last night sometime, before midnight, of course, for uh, Cleveland, Ohio. Only two people reported feeling it. That's not too surprising for a 2.0. 2.0s can be felt, depending on, you know, what their source is, how shallow they are. Now let's go check out the closest seismic station, quick arrival time. So it's N4M52A HHZ. Let's check that out on the seismic program swarm. Here we are in the seismic program swarm with station M52A in the N4 network, which is supposedly the closest seismic station to the magnitude 2.0 at 5.0 kilometers in depth, which struck Ohio. Let's turn persistent rescale off, do 95 overlap for the spectrogram. And here it is right here at 415. Yep, this is it right here. Notice something strange. All earthquakes that I'm used to on the west coast always have lower frequencies. But this, let's check 55 hertz. But this, look, I had to go to a maximum frequency range on the spectrogram of 50. What? Where are the lower frequencies? Let's look at the spectra plot of this event. Look at that. Of course, there's a spike right here, but you see this almost monochromatic spike? That's from the microseisms, the background microseisms, because this is a broadband station, which records microseisms too well at some points. But notice how there are no weaker, lower frequencies at all. Usually we see, you know, the power a lot of the time for a lot of earthquakes is in the lower frequency band. But this one, very strange. Let's go back to the spectrogram again. Very strange. Dominant frequencies around 10 to 15 hertz. Of course, weaker frequencies going below and above, but not going below 3.4 hertz. So pretty much anything below 3.4 hertz was not seen for this earthquake, which is very odd. Going up to about 10,000 amplitude counts. So it is, again, not surprising that somebody felt this. Downwards dipping P wave, which is showing dilation, I guess, instead of compression. That's at least my take from it, from what the people from Iris told me. So that's the 2.0 in Ohio. Let's move on to something else. Okay, so I'm going to deal with three things today for Yellowstone, but for right now, I want to take a look at this just real quick. We're going to use Borehole 208 because it was obviously the closest seismic station to this event. Here is Borehole 208. Scroll down. Notice how we do have a swarm. See these oscillations right here? That is the teleseism, as you will see in a second, from the magnitude 6.4 New Zealand, I believe, unless it was another from another global earthquake, but... Harmonic tremor, volcanic tremor, do not carry frequencies this low. In order for you to see waveform oscillations on a web recorder, the frequencies have to be pretty dang low and very spread out. So, frequency is too low, too low. But let's just keep looking at this. Let's see, it showed on borehole 206 as well, just a couple. Of course, it is looking like this swarm, very, very minor, teeny, tiny swarm, was only shown on a couple stations. Only a few surrounding stations, borehole 206, YUF, possibly even YML, LKWY, and Borhol 208, and YLA is showing it as well. But these look very tiny and very shallow, but why don't we go take a look at it in the Seismic Program Swarm. Here we are in the Seismic Program Swarm with Borhol 208 open. Persistent rescale off, do 95 overlap for that. Okay, we don't need a frequency filter or anything. Not seen much, only 10 amplitude count for the background microseisms. Extremely, extremely quiet. Here's the Earthquake Swarm right here. Not seeing any low frequency earthquakes yet, but look at how closely spaced some of these events are. Look at that. These are obviously three earthquakes occurring right here. You could tell P and S wave arrivals, but three occurring in very rapid succession. Let's go to the spectrogram, shall we? Zoom all the way out. Yep, this looks like a normal rapid fire swarm for the Yellowstone Lake and West Thumb Lake areas, which happens from time to time. But you know, if you go to my website, go to my website and click the uh, Seismic Events drop-down menu and click West Thumb, Rapid Fire, Energetic Swarms, or whatever it says for West Thumb under the Seismic Events drop-down menu. Click that and take a look at all of the Rapid Fire Swarms that have occurred from 2014 to 2018. A lot of seismic plots and images on there. But if you want to see the most major swarms, the most important, craziest swarms, then you have to click the dates at the beginning of the page or later on while you're scrolling down through the page. Okay, so we do see some more earthquakes. I'm going to say maybe, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. I'm not trying to do an exact estimate right now. Just a rough, rough estimate. Maybe 10 to 15 microquakes in a very short time frame with them being very, very close together. 
I mean, look right here, you can see an earthquake occurred right after this one. But the largest event, the largest of them all, is this one right here going up to about 2,000, 2,200 amplitude count. So very weak, very teeny, teeny, tiny, but it did happen nonetheless. Again, borehole 208, we did have a tiny, very tiny microquake swarm, rapid fire microquake swarm. And then there were some poppings throughout the day, pop, 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 pop. Recently, there are still some more tiny, tiny, tiny microquakes popping off. Up here, we do see, notice this is the telecism. Look at the frequency band. Let's look at the dominant frequencies of this, shall we? Let's turn log power off. Oh, yeah. Starts at 0 0.04 hertz and ends at 0 0.06 hertz. This is definitely, definitely a telecism, most likely from the 6.4 New Zealand but it could be from something else. But again, dominant frequencies around 0 0.04 to 0 0.076 or so. Very interesting, very low frequencies for that. So, swarm did happen. Next, I would like to talk about something on Seismic Station YNM. Now, like I said in the beginning of the video, Seismic Station YNM usually does not detect surface noise. The only thing Seismic Station YNM detects is basically, I mean, of course, any vibration that reaches the station will be recorded, like any other seismometer. It's not designed to pick up certain vibrations. Seismometers pick up all vibrations, no matter what. But Seismic Station YNM is inside the Norris Museum, so usually it only detects steamboat eruptions and footsteps. Yes, guys, it detects footsteps quite well. Seriously, you can watch people walking by the Seismic Station. You can even test it yourself. If you're at the Norris Museum and you have your laptop and you got Wi-Fi, Touch the monitor or just stomp three times right next to it. Then open your laptop, download the seismic data a few minutes after that happened, and look at your own footsteps. Yes, you can do that. It's pretty cool. Now, let's scroll down again, YNM. I saw something right here. I was like, what? Did Steamboat erupt again? But it doesn't even look like an eruption because, look, it's erupt abruptly stops right there. And the frequencies are all off. They're wacky. So first, before I looked at that, I wanted to go to, oh, we got a geyser erupting there, but that's not what I wanted to look at. Go to volcanoes.usgs.gov. Before I looked at the seismic data, I wanted to see if there was an eruption spike. Because whenever there's an eruption, there is a spike on the Tantalus stream gauge. Be careful you're not seeing precipitation spikes. But precipitation spikes are almost always easy to distinguish from real steamboat eruptions. Real steamboat eruptions are very, very like this look notice how that's a perfect spike i mean perfect angle perfect spike these are precipitation spikes you know little tiny spikes like that and like that this right here was the eruption we just talked about that occurred on march 5th which was the eighth eruption of 2019. so today with this very weird event right here i wanted to see if it showed on the stream gauge it doesn't not at all only seeing precipitation here I'm not seeing any additional spikes that could account for this most recent event on YNM. It doesn't even look like footsteps either. I don't know what the heck it is, but let's check it out in the Seismic Program Swarm. Here we are, YNM, HHG, let's go forward. Now, again, remember, this is the teleseism from, let's look at the dominant frequency, shall we? This is the teleseism from the magnitude 6.4, I believe, in Papua New Guinea. Dominant frequencies of this event remain about 0.04 hertz to about 0.7 hertz or so, which is exactly what we saw on borehole 208. It's appearing at the same time. That is definitely a teleseism. Let's set overlap to 95. Now let's take a look at the main course, what I wanted to talk about. So we have the teleseism, which occurred right before this event right here. Look at this. Now I have a dominant frequency range of 25 hertz for the spectrogram. Let's go to 55 if it'll let me. No, it'll only do 50. Okay, that's good enough. Steamboat eruptions recently have been occurring down near this level, around 20 hertz, going a little bit below and a little bit above, but mainly around that area. I don't know what this is. Obviously this could be a steamboat eruption, but if it were, then how come it didn't show at all on the stream gauge? I thought that was very interesting. Here's what the waveforms looked like of this event. Very peculiar, and look at how high the frequencies are. Look how far I have to zoom in. So very high frequencies. Don't even know what in the world could possibly cause this on Seismic Station Y and M. Did not see any footsteps prior or after, so no one walked up to it and did anything weird with it. So I don't know. I don't know, guys. This is all up in the air. It's a very, very strange event. 
But let's take a look at it on the closest seismic station, Y and R, to see if this appeared at the same exact time. So here we are at Seismic Station YNR, which is the second closest seismic station to Steamboat Geyser. And, okay, so let's go. This is the Teleseism. Definitely the Teleseism from the 6.4 in New Zealand, I believe. I could be wrong about that, but I believe. Obviously, it's not a local event. You could tell it did occur some distance away. It looks very similar to the Mayotte event that occurred. Wow, look at that. That looks just like the Mayotte event that occurred near Mayotte in Madagascar on November 11th, 2018. Remember that? If you don't know about it, go to my website, go to the Seismic Events 2 drop-down menu, and click World, and it's the first event shown. Now, so we've got that right there. Okay, so let's move forward. Let's go to the spectrogram, because I'd rather use that to just quickly look for something. So over here in YNM, we have that strange event, right? 1650. I'm gonna say it started at about 1650, right? Let's go down 1650. 1650 would be right here. Nope. So it did not show on Seismic Station YNR, but the Teleseism did. So obviously it wasn't that crazy of a seismic event, if it was seismic. Definitely some type of surface event, I guess. I don't know for sure, but that's what it's looking like right now because it's not showing on the stream gauge or the closest seismic stations to this event. But there is one last thing I would like to look at real quick, which I think is very peculiar. Now, Borehole 950, what is this? Right down here. Now, of course, I do believe surface events are still possible on boreholes, but boreholes do minimize the surface events greatly. Don't know what that is. So it's shown on Y and R as well, near the 1930 line. Let's see, 1930 line. But it is not showing on YML. So if this is indeed seismic and it's major, then it should show on the surrounding seismic stations. YM, Cedar, Maple Creek, 1939, which is where we should we should see it. Uh, no, it's not shown at all there. Uh, MCID is having a big problem today, guys. Big problem. But why don't we just download the data from Borehole 950 and just look at the characteristics just real fast of this strange emergent event right here. Now, here's the data stream from the UNAVCO PB Borehole 950 station. Let's scroll down. Here is the event I was talking about at the 930 UTC line right here. Very emergent, very long and drawn out, and it did show on the borehole. And it is quite weak, but it did not show on any surrounding stations. Borehole 950 and YN are the only two stations that are showing this. Remember, Borehole 950 is directly under YNR. I don't know what is going on here. Does not look like construction because, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think so. I don't know what this is though. It doesn't even make sense. Personally, it doesn't even look. Look at the dominant frequency range. Look at that. Those are some lower frequencies. We do see some type of monochromatic signal, which to me looks anthropogenic, which means caused by humans. I believe this is caused by humans. This line, just right here. But this down here, that looks intriguing. Let's see, let's look at the dominant frequencies of this strange event, shall we? Let's log frequency back on. Okay, so we have that monochromatic signal, that spike, which occurred somewhat around 7.25 hertz. But the main event that we are interested in is this one right here, which started at about 2 hertz and ends at about 6 hertz. So it is not necessarily a low frequency event. It does have dominant lower frequencies, but it has some weaker frequencies going a little bit higher than the low frequency band. So I don't know what that is. You let me know what you think this is. I'll let that simmer just for a little bit. Let's look at the recent earthquakes just before I go, shall we? Just before I go. And you can actually see some of the recent earthquakes down here. They have listed some of the major recent ones. 6.4 occurred... Not too long, actually, wait, at 15 UTC, at 15 UTC, let's see, when did we see that teleseism? Let me go back, just for a second. Let's file open, let's do, okay, so here's the teleseism. Regardless of where it is from, that is obviously a teleseism. It started at about 1634, right? Well, let's go back, 1634, 1634. And this occurred at 1546. Now, with the distance between New Zealand and the United States, that does sound correct. Now, seismic waves, let's say they occurred 
in an area of the world that takes the longest for the seismic waves to travel, it can take up to an hour to an hour and 15 minutes for seismic waves to travel from any event on the opposite side of the world to us right here. It all depends on the process and how deep it is and whether it travels through the mantle, through the outer core, or through the core itself. So I do believe that Telecism is from the 6.4 in New Zealand. Let's go to latest earthquakes just real fast, see if anything has popped up since I have recorded this video. Let's go back, go to the world. Again, we're only seeing those three earthquakes that I just looked at, uh, that I just mentioned earlier. And then we did have this one. We did have one more in Hawaii, a 2.1 at 14.9 kilometers in depth, right off the western, I'm going to say northwestern coast of the Big Island. So that happened. We looked at some interesting stuff today. Please bookmark my website. A link is in the description box below. Don't forget to check out Scott's new channel called the NW Geology Guy. And apparently here in Seattle, well, 20 miles northeast of Seattle, we are going to get some snow tonight. Apparently, that's what they're saying. Here we go again. And it's still and it's March, guys. It's like late spring, I guess. Like where's where's this where's the summer, guys? Where's summer? It's going to be nice to get some nice warm and sunny weather soon but my daughter really wants to build one more snowman and i can't say no to her i wish i could make it snow we really do and she says it's so cute i mean with those puppy dog eyes i mean how can you say no to that <laughs> also guys i forgot to put this into the video so i'm putting this at the end of the video someone did recently send me an email minus k and i thank you uh, minus k for sending me this email um, so I do have some people who watch the webcams for me since I usually do not have time to watch the webcams and Sometimes, you know, this steam from Old Faithful does look dark. Sometimes I believe it's due to shadowing Sometimes I believe it's due to thicker steam, but however However that being said They said oh my god look at this it looks like some smoke and maybe it is and I am starting to be inclined to believe it's smoke but there hasn't been any harmonic or volcanic tremor signaling the magma is rising into the system causing rock to burn to create smoke but there could be some brine some hot brine down there or something down there creating an exceptional amount of heat to create this now i want you guys to notice how dark now that's old faithful right there and not only is old faithful dark but the steam from the geysers also in the background are dark as well i do not know what this is being caused by here could be caused by a shadow but look at this right here that is not a shadow guys because the sun is even shining directly on the geyser right here again i do not believe that this is a shadow at all i mean maybe some of it down here could be but look at the steam even up here i mean the sun is behind the camera guys it is not in order for it to be a shadow being cast and causing it to look dark it would the sun would have to be over there the sun is literally shining on the steam and it doesn't really look how dirty it looks I'm just kind of surprised. Look at this right here. Do you see that? That is extremely dark. Personally, I have never seen it that dark before. I don't know why it would be, but I just want to say thank you to Minus K for sending it in. And if any of you guys have any images uh, from the webcams or you just want to monitor them for me, please send me images. I'm open to all that stuff. Just email me some images and just let me know if you see anything concerning or anything weird on the webcams. And I'll just keep an eye on the seismograms. Again, thank you guys. Keep an eye on Old Faithful. And see you later.